you have your Bibles with you, would you open them with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be looking this morning at a very familiar passage of Scripture, probably a passage that's a lot easier to memorize than it is to apply. But I I want you to know this morning that we're going to be talking about being anxious. So this is probably something that no one can relate to, or perhaps something that everyone can relate to. You remember what it's like to be anxious, right? You, you know what it's like to have anxious thoughts and to just deal with the stress and the pressure. Maybe a clip from this children's movie will help you remember what anxiety looks like. Hello, Lucy. This is Gru. I know up to this point our relationship has been strictly professional and you're leaving for Australia and all, but okay, here is the question. Would you like to go out on a date? Uh, no. Okay, that's not helping. All right, here we go. For real this time. Mm. I can do this. maybe not the best way to deal with anxiety, huh? I hope this morning that when we leave, we can deal with anxiety a little bit better than that. So let's look to the Word of God together. Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 6, the Word of God says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, If there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you have learned and received and heard in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we confess this morning your word is truth and life. And Lord, we also confess that that we need your strength and your wisdom and knowing how to apply your word. I I pray, Father, this morning that your word would speak to us, would challenge us. Father, that we would leave this place changed by the power of your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, as we think this morning about anxiety, anxious thoughts, and trying to frame our study of Philippians through this lens, what does passion for God look like? I think the answer singularly is this, passion for God is prayerfully minded. When we're thinking about anxiety or anxious thoughts or being anxious, ultimately the remedy for that is that we are prayerfully minded, that we are so passionate about our relationship and our walk with God that we instinctively take things to the Lord in prayer rather than becoming anxious and dwelling on them. And again, Philippians 4, 6 in particular, a much easier verse to memorize than to apply, but I believe in this passage we find four truths that we are to apply. And let's talk about those this morning. Four truths that we need to apply. The the first one we see in verse 6, pray about everything. Now, that, that just seems overwhelming, doesn't it? But you heard the command, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, present your requests to God. 
And, and I think we, we kind of get this when we talk about praying about everything. Big things we get, don't we? Big things on our list like a medical diagnosis or fear of a medical diagnosis or a job transition or change, economic situations, relationships that are difficult, big things we get and we instinctively know we need to pray about those things. Well, what about small things? When the Bible says that we need to be praying about everything, we need to take all things to the Lord in prayer. One of the big things that I think you parents and grandparents, you pray about is how your children or who your children will marry. You probably are very concerned about that young man or that young woman that they'll be with for the rest of their lives. And if you are a parent or a grandparent, you probably spent many times praying for your future spouse or the future spouse of your child or your grandchild. That would be a big thing. What about the small things? Are you praying for your future spouse's parents? Are you, are you praying for the home that they grow up in? Are you praying for their friends? Do you remember the kind of trouble you got into with your friends? Do you want your future children's and grandchildren's spouse to have good friends? Certainly. The small things tend to elude us sometimes because we're so consumed about the big things, but really this text talks about how we should pray about anxious things. And what are anxious things? What is it that causes anxiety and stress and fear for you? If I were to ask you, the answer would probably be different for just about everyone in this room. Some of you, the biggest anxious thought that you could have is that somehow I would call upon you at this very moment to come up here and speak and share a few things with us. And even now, some of you are sweating, thinking, is he really going to do that? And if you've been thinking through the message already, you're already praying and saying, God, please don't let him do that to me right now. Anxious things, we tend to, we tend to think about things that give us anxiety and I'm afraid that our, our failure so often is when we have anxious thoughts, we're not instinctive about praying through them. Usually when we have anxious thoughts, we're very quick to think through and try to rationalize and find answers and solutions and a, a, an approach and a strategy and something that will work. We're people that are pragmatic here in the West, aren't we? But the command of Scripture is to take anxious thoughts, anxious things before the throne of God. And, and I guess it would be appropriate to ask why, and hopefully we don't necessarily need to dwell on that, but if we're going to pray about everything, even anxious things, there's a great big why. Because there's a God who loves you and has called you into fellowship with Himself. There's a God who in His holiness is taking all things and working them together for your good and His glory. And those things aren't mutually exclusive. So when you face anxious situations in life, remember that you are related to a loving, gracious God who sees you, knows you intimately, and is calling you into deeper faith, commitment, and relationship to Himself. And He desires that you would take anxious things before his throne. So the first truth, harder to apply than to memorize, give, pray about everything. And, and here's the second truth, which maybe is even a little bit more difficult. Give thanks. And I suppose I could put that phrase out there in everything. Did you notice the text? Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. It's one thing to say that we're thankful. It's another thing to give thanks in all circumstances, isn't it? I mean, when you're really stressed and anxious and, and you find yourself at the end of your rope, is it really appropriate to say, God, thank you for this? Well, that's really the command of Scripture. Even James writes it this way, when you face trials of various kinds, we should do that with joy, knowing that God is at work. 
there's something about the attitude of giving thanks that puts us in right relationship with God and in right relationship to our stress and our anxiety. Think about that for a moment. There's something about giving thanks to God that gives us right relationship to God and right relationship to our anxiety. If we are thankful in the circumstance and we're thankful in the situation, even that which is causing us stress and anxiety, it reminds us that there's something much larger at work and something much greater at play than my anxious thoughts in the moment. If I'm truly giving thanks and stopping and considering the goodness of God, even in stressful, anxious times, it reminds me that there is a God who is at work, and He's much larger than the circumstances I face, and He's certainly greater than the thoughts that are consuming my mind. Somebody should say amen at that point. When we face our anxious thoughts with a thankful and grateful heart, it puts us in right relationship to God and our anxiety and our stress. Uh, Again, because I want to remind you that when we're praying and we're putting our thoughts Godward, it reminds us that there is a God who is for us. He's not against us, and He is at work in this circumstance. Now, The next truth has to do with what we dwell upon. Did you notice Philippians 4, 8? There's such a long list there. Those things that are true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, worthy of praise, that's what we're to dwell upon. Now, let me just stop for a moment before I unpack some of that. When we pray about everything the singular audience that we're approaching in prayer is the Lord, right? Now, here's the temptation when we're anxious and we're worried and we're stressed about things. Instead of seeking that singular audience and letting our request be known, what do we tend to do? Well, this generation would pull out their phone and take a selfie and then put a little you know, Snapchat it to somebody. Or maybe if you're a little bit older, you'd text it. Or, or if you're a little bit older still, you'd pick up your cell phone and call. Or, or maybe you'd pick up your landline and call. Or maybe you'd write a... The tendency is to talk to some people about our stress, right? And, and the larger we can make that circle, the better we tend to feel about ourselves. If we could just let everybody know how miserable we are, then maybe we start to feel... What's the expression? Misery loves company. You see, you know how this works, don't you? And so when we tend to spread our anxiety, and if we think if we can spread it thin enough and far enough, it'll dissipate. But what happens, the more we dwell upon it, the more we talk about it, and the more we share it with other people, the more the anxiety comes back and returns to us because we have more people encouraging us about how awful the situation is, how horrible it is, and I don't know how you're going to get through that. But when we come and we have a singular audience, we're laying those things before His throne. And then we're commanded, not only as we lay them down at His throne with thanksgiving, we're also commanded to fix our mind on those things that are right. Look look at it again. Those things that are true. Wouldn't it be good when you're facing anxious thoughts, if you just paused for a moment and said, "But, but God, what is true here? And sometimes a simple truth that needs to be stated and spoken out loud and reminded, God, you're still on your throne. But I just lost my job. But my husband just walked out the door. But I know that if I write this check, there's no way it's going to clear the bank. And God is still on his throne. Whatever is true, fix your mind on those things that are honorable what is it in this situation, in this circumstance that is stressing that I can say is honorable, that is good, that exalts other people? What is just? What is pure? Is there anything in this circumstance that I could consider lovely? And it may be that the loveliness is knowing that that God is merciful and gracious. Is there things that are commendable, things that are worthy of praise? It's one thing to say, do not be anxious. 
isn't that great advice? Oh, you shouldn't worry about that. Thank you. Thank you for telling me not to worry about that. I'll, by the way, don't look at that door right there either. Because I don't want anyone to be concerned about what's by that door over there. Please, don't look at that door. How many of you are dying to turn around and look at that door right now? That's what happens sometimes when we say, don't be anxious. And and then all we can think about is, is anxiety and being anxious. But I'm so glad that the Scriptures are prescriptive for us. Because it's not just that we are not to be anxious. The prescription is that we take that to the Lord. And not only do we stop there, but when we're hearing from God, we fill our minds with truth. If you don't want to be anxious, you've got to replace anxious thoughts with true thoughts and right thoughts and good thoughts. And I think so many people just say, well, prayer never really worked for me. I just don't think that that really works. And it's because you somehow saw God as this fairy that if you just left everything there, that he would graciously, instantaneously fix all things And you never really left anything at his feet. You never heard truth from him. You just continued on in your anxious thoughts and walked down the road and said that didn't work. No, the the command of Scripture is whatever is all these things, set your minds on these things. And And the language Paul is using there is very strong. He's saying exercise all of your mental faculties to consider these things. So when you're in the midst of stress and you're in the midst of anxiety, you need to truly fix your heart and your mind on truth. And that comes as you approach God in prayer and approach Him in the right way with humility and giving thanks. And it comes as you're transformed and changed by the very truth of His Word. So four truths to apply. And and trust me, I know these verses are so much easier to memorize than to apply. But God is calling us to a deeper commitment and deeper walk with Him, and a passion for God truly as prayerfully minded, and it calls us to exercise faith with regard to these things. And that last truth to believe or to apply is to follow godly people. Did you notice that in verse 9? What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. That we're called to follow godly people. I'm sure that you, like me, have watched many godly men and women face what you would say would be insurmountable circumstances. And with awe and with glory pointing towards God at work in their lives, you just say, I I, I pray that I'm that strong. I pray that when dark and difficult and trying times come my way, that God would fill me and strengthen me and encourage me the way he did sister or brother, and you fill in the blank. You've seen it. And Paul, in a very real sense, is saying, those things that you've learned from me, put into practice. Follow the godly example that I've set for you. And then he used those three words to describe how you've learned it. Those things that you've received, those things that you've heard, those things that you've seen. Well, when we talk about things that we've received and learned, I I want you to know Paul, in a sense, is talking about the tradition that I've passed on to you. There was something about the early church. They began to meet on the first day of the week. Not on the Sabbath, but on the first day, because they were commemorating, remembering the Lord's resurrection. And they met together and they studied about the power of the resurrection, how it changes and transforms lives. And there was a tradition that was set and that was passed along. What about in your family? What traditions are you setting for your children, for your grandchildren? What are they learning from you, observing? What are they receiving from you in your life? You know, it's, it's not a bad tradition to pray before you eat. It, it teaches a generation that we give thanks to God and we recognize His provision for all things. It, it's not a bad tradition to show up to church on Sunday mornings, recognizing no matter what else is going on in our lives, we're committing time to come together with 
fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and were worshiping. There are things that, that you receive that are passed on in tradition. There are things that are taught, those things that you have heard. Who, who are you listening to as you follow godly people? Who do you have that's pouring into your life, speaking truth over you? Who's that person that when you're flipped out and anxious and stressed, says to you, you need to start paying attention to some truth? Who is it that's teaching you, that's guiding you? If you don't have that person in your life, and if you're not pouring into that person in your life, can I encourage you, you need to be looking for those relationships and those things that you've seen. And that's where I began as we began talking about following the example of godly people. It's just what you've seen, what you've observed in other people's lives. You you see, if if we really want to deal with stress and anxiety in our lives, it, it demands that we speak to an audience of one and not just a bunch of people. We let our requests be known to Him. And that we do it with a right heart attitude, that I'm, I'm coming you, to you in humility. I'm going to give thanks, God, for even this stressful situation because I know you're at work. And God, teach me and show me to fix my mind on what's true and what's right, what's noble, what's just. Teach me to think on the right things in the middle of this stress. And God, thank you for pouring godly people into my life and setting an example that I can walk by them. Four truths to apply. And this is the part where the sermon could get really anxious for some of you because I've already preached a four-point sermon and now this next slide is going to say three promises to believe. So if you put on a roast for Mother's Day, I hope you put it on low. You don't need to be anxious. We won't be long. But there are some promises to believe from God's Word this morning as well. If you're going to practice those truths, if you're going to apply them, there ought to be some comfort in knowing that there's reason to apply them. And the first promise of of Scripture that I see here in this verse that we need to believe is this. God will hear you. Did did you see that in verse 6? Let your requests be made known to God. It's not as though God is cosmically out there somewhere, and maybe if you get this just right, He'll hear your prayer. No, God is present. He will hear you. As a matter of fact, we know it's the promise one of the children said this just a few moments ago from Romans chapter 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Even though our sin separates us from God, the heart that is repentant, the heart that is humble, that is crying out to God, God is able to hear, and He will. So as you're going to say, well, I'm going to pray about everything, believe this promise, God will hear you. And not only that, but notice the the great promise of of verse 7 and and what we so often cling to. God will calm you. I I believe Philippians 4, 7 is probably one of the most quoted verses of Scripture when you think about somebody that's facing tremendous pain or heartache or grief. Somebody who's lost a loved one. Somebody who's facing a health challenge that's just so great. And it seems that it's instinctive to pray, God, I pray you'd guard their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus with a peace that passes understanding. Now, notice this is truth. He didn't say, and God may guard your heart. God will. This is a promise from him. And notice that it's regardless of circumstance. Nothing changed with regard to circumstance from the time you begin to pray about those anxious things to the moment God hears and begins to respond and bring strength and peace to you. Isn't it amazing how often we pray about circumstances changing and how little we pray about character being developed? 
Uh, we have prayer lists of people who are afflicted and people who are suffering. And, and we long for God to change circumstance, but sometimes it's the character that's changed, not the circumstance. And it's when God begins to touch our hearts and change our character and change our thoughts and fix our minds on those things that are true, that the peace of God and the calming effect of God comes all over us. And, and notice the way that God will calm you. It's regardless of circumstance, and it's through Jesus. And, and the peace of God, which transcends or passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There's no peace God can afford a sinner apart from the person and work of Jesus Christ. You will never know peace and comfort and joy and security apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And friends, if, you come, if you've come to a point where you understand that in spite of your great sin, in spite of all the things that you've done that have separated and cut you off from life in Christ, in spite of the fact that you would look God and, and walk the other way, if you recognize that God loves you in spite of all those things, and you recognize the truth of Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates His own love toward us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm telling you, there's a peace that passes all understanding. Because no matter the mess we've made of our lives, no matter the circumstances that we face, there's a God who's demonstrated a perfect, holy, and abiding love to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. There's no other hope, there's no other peace, there's nothing else to offer but praise be to God, Jesus Christ is enough. God will calm you. The word is, he sets a guard. He sets up a wall. He, he sets up this, this space that he creates guarding your heart and your mind. A peace that passes understanding. When we look to the finished work of Jesus Christ and we know how greatly God has loved us, that he spared not his only son, how can we not believe that he would graciously give us all things, as the scripture says? God will hear you. God will calm you. And, and then notice that last promise at the end of verse 9. God will be with you. As a matter of fact, the way Paul says it, and the God of peace will be with you. I, I don't know. It, it seems that when we're in our anxious moments and when we're stressed, that we want to pick up the phone. We want to call someone. We just, we want to share this experience with someone. But can I remind you when you begin to pray, you begin to fix your minds on truth that you have the very presence of God Almighty with you. God himself will be with you. Can, can I remind you what William Barclay said? Remember when you pray that the love of God wants the best for you. The wisdom of God knows the best for you. And the power of God can accomplish the best for you. It's not trite, it's not meaningless, it's not empty to say that when we're anxious, we need to present our request to God. He loves us. He knows what is best, and He is able to accomplish the best for us. And when we approach Him, we can know the sweet promise of Scripture that James says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. He will hear us, he will calm you, he will be with you. Passion for God is prayerfully minded. So when you begin to face anxious things, 
that instinctively, because of the great love that God has poured out in your heart through the Holy Spirit, your natural response begins to say, God, I need you. I need you to point my mind to truth. God, I thank you for this difficult situation because I know you're at work and here are all my needs and you just lay them out. And maybe this morning there's somebody that's been carrying a burden that's been just so heavy on their hearts. You walk into a season or a day like today, Mother's Day, and a season that is joyful for many has just been a wait for you. Maybe you're thinking about your own family situation and and the dynamics in your home are are very different than what you'd portray as you sit in a pew. Or maybe you're just facing the anxious thoughts of, of what will the next day at work hold? Will there be work the next day? Maybe you're facing the anxious thoughts of, of, of overwhelming financial pressures. And, and maybe your reaction is not like what I've described, and you haven't told anyone these thoughts. You've just been bearing the weight of them. Can I encourage you this morning? You don't have to carry those anxious thoughts and that burden. You can come to Jesus and receive from Him a burden that is light, a yoke that is easy. You can receive from Him a peace that transcends, that passes understanding. And it may be that all these anxious thoughts have just kept you separated from God. And the joy of your salvation seems to be escaping. This morning you could just return to Him plainly. Say, God, I I desire the joy of my salvation, your salvation be restored to me. God, I, I just want to give these anxious thoughts to you and fix my mind on truth. Or it may be this morning that the anxious thoughts have just revealed in your own heart the fact that you've never really trusted in the work of God. You've never really trusted in all that Jesus has done for you. But you're just spent by the weight of relying on your own self-assurance and your own self-made manhood or womanhood to get you through. And you recognize this morning that you've just been trying to do life in your own strength and you're ready this morning to turn to the Lord and say, God, I come to you. I know that I've lived my own way. I've made a mess of my life. But Lord, I just come to you believing that you love me and that even though I've sinned and my sin is separated from me, I believe that you gave your son Jesus on the cross. Help me to live for you from this day forward. I need the peace that your word promises. Are you ready to respond to God and his truth? Are you ready to come to him this morning, leaving your anxious thoughts and embracing his peace and his strength and his promises? Well, pray with me. God, we're thankful for the reminder this morning that a passion for you is prayerfully minded. God, may it be that we would be instinctively turned to prayer. May it be that our hearts are so moved by your great love and your power and your work in our lives that we would seek a singular audience with anxious thoughts. God, I pray for some here this morning who are bearing a heavy load. I pray even in these moments they would release that and have the joy of your salvation return to their hearts. And God, for some here this morning who've never trusted in you, never come to a place where they've confessed their sin and and turned from that to turn towards you and your provision, help them in these very moments to turn to Jesus and to find him being all sufficient, all they ever needed. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.